with great pleasure, I'm introducing the next speaker, Rod Newcomb. And I'm going to read this here. So let's see. 10.30 to 11.30. That must have been when the era that you were born. No. <laughs> 1964. 1964, Ski Patrol at Alta. Man, I bet that was really pretty nice back then. 1964, 65, Patrol at Vale. Avalanche Forecaster at Jackson Hole from 65 to 71. I bet that was really nice. Um, 71 through 74, Research Assistant in Silverton, Colorado. We heard about that from Don. 1974, started the American Avalanche Institute and was the, the lifeblood of that until he stopped doing that in 2012. And that's a pretty illustrious career, but um, for me, um, you represent a lot more than just what's on this paper. Rod, you, uh, you've certainly been one of my heroes. And um, I think that uh, you really changed the face of avalanche education in at least this country. And I know a lot of Canadians came down and took your courses too, so you may have had those there. And, uh, and I think that it's, uh, that it's, uh, there are probably a lot of really talented mountaineers and uh, avalanche people who, uh, you know, not particularly that nice to be around. If you combine uh, the qualities of a good mountaineer and a really a great person and appreciate the influence you've had on my life. So without further ado, Rod Newcomb. Well, a lot of you folks in this room have worked with me on uh, AVI courses, and uh, a good part of what I know about snow and avalanche ha has come from all the instructors that uh, I have listened to in class, and that certainly includes Liam. Uh, Liam's job there when he took over the highway was really high powered, and some of that came out, I think, as he was speaking. But uh, <coughs> the risk on highways is measured <coughs> by the traffic count and what happens if an avalanche runs and cars get stacked up behind and the number of avalanche paths that may hit those cars. And that risk factor on Little Cottonwood Canyon is off the chart. And to Liam's credit, and those working before him, uh, there have been very, very few incidences of highway problems. So uh, I want this to be sort of an open forum. And uh, uh, if any of you, mostly older folks, gray-haired folks, have comments, just speak right up. I want to begin by talking a little bit about my perspective. You know, history is sort of uh, what comes out of the speaker's mouth. <laughs> and from time to time, I may have my years off or my decades off. Uh, don't hesitate to correct me. But I want to talk a little bit about the role of Bridger Bozeman in the 60s. I don't think uh, Bridger got enough credit and the folks here at Bozeman uh, as to what went on up here in the 60s. In the early 60s at Jackson, we knew Bridger Bowl was up north somewhere, but we didn't know quite how to get there in the winter by driving up here. So of the 2,000 or so people that lived in Jackson Hole at that time, there was about a half a dozen or so that could afford to go skiing elsewhere, and they went to Sun Valley or Alta. We didn't hear that much about Bridger. Uh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about Montaigne and uh, my perspective of what he did for the industry. Uh, now, John had roots in Jackson. He was in World War II, uh, came back, got married, 
and for a period of time uh, taught school in Jackson, became principal of one of the schools, was a ski coach, and then came up to, to Bozeman. And uh, in the early 60s, or mid-60s, when uh, Jackson opened, or shortly after Jackson opened, the Big Hill, uh, word got around town that he was coming to, uh, uh, to tell us about some of the work he was doing here. And he brought his little Super 8 projector and showed us a cornice development that he managed to time-lapse photography uh, using an insulated box up there in the ridge and a, uh, some kind of a <coughs> clock that, that went on uh, uh, periodically and he had this uh, time-lapse photography of a cornice building and it's the cornice built right straight out and at that time it had never occurred to me how a cornice built. You're working an avalanche and you, you just want to take care of the cornice after it builds. Uh, talk a little bit about the evolution of uh, avalanche workshops. Uh, from time to time I hear about, yeah, you know, they started the ISSWs up there in Canada. So let me give you a, a brief history of avalanche workshops in North America. The first one was in May of 71 at uh, University of Washington, put on by La Chapelle. Uh, there was no field session associated with it. Small classroom, probably 30 people there, mostly from the Northwest. And uh, unfortunately, the proceedings of that never got published. So there's no record of that workshop. A few months after the workshop, La Chapelle sent a letter out and he said, sorry folks, uh, I did not get the information, uh, the photo ready, so there is no uh, of proceedings uh, coming out of that workshop. And then in 1976, Peter Scherer, with the backing of Environment Canada, uh, put on a workshop at the Banff. Uh, it was in a classroom about this size, probably about the same amount of people that are here. And uh, they set the standard for 20 minutes for each speaker, 15 minutes to talk, five minutes for questions and answers. And in the middle of the workshop, we had our field trip, which at that time was uh, Rogers Pass. In 1980, Peter Scherer put on another one with the backing and funding of the uh, uh, Canadian government in Vancouver. And uh, the same format, it was a small auditorium, probably twice as many people that are here in this room. Field session was at uh, Whistler. And at the end of that conference, uh, Peter Scherer said, now we should have these every two years and it's the turn for those of you in the U.S. to hold the next one. And uh, John Montaigne and a small group of folks, including Ed Adams, uh, raise your head, at, uh, your hand, uh, Ed. <laughs> Faye Johnson, where are you, Faye? Uh, and uh, a few others, I know Jim Wood, let's see, was, was Fremper among that group? Uh, yeah. And uh, these folks were all going to school, and you all got together, as I understand it, from time to time, and talked about snow and avalanches. And you folks came up with what we now call the ISSW. Uh, I, I was very impressed when I got that first brochure. It must have been in, in the summer or fall of 1981. You are invited to attend the international, that, that, that word was important. <laughs> Man, you folks are going big time. <laughs> and then you did. Folks came from Japan, Europe, uh, ski areas down south, international snow science. Wow, you know, snow science, I'm going to learn something. Workshop. 
<laughs> and not a seminar, you know, a workshop. And with your field session here at, uh, at Bridger, and at that time your bomb trams were just coming in, so it was a great field session. Importantly, after that, Montaigne had the sense to gather a few folks together, and we became a steering committee. I think there was about eight or nine or ten. Faye, you're not in your head. We're, we're, you, you were probably in that room. And we had to figure out how this thing was going to continue. And there was some discussion. I, I think everybody thought, you know, this needs the backing of a big university because we sure weren't getting any money from the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Forest Service had completely backed off at that time of uh, avalanche research in this country. And uh, I remember there was some discussion about, well, how about the Northwest and La Chapelle and Marriott and Moore? But no one really wanted to do it. And off in the corner, sat a fellow from Aspen, Greg Mace. He was in charge of uh, the um, search and rescue in Pitkin County. And he said very quietly, he said, you know, I've got the backing of the ski areas and search and rescue, I can do it. And a little more discussion and it seemed that, hey, this is a guy that really wants to do it. And, uh, so we ended up in Aspen in uh, 84 and put on a great program. Sort of set the standard for how ISSWs are going to operate, which is somebody has to step to the plate and, and say, I will do it. I will get all these volunteers, because it was all volunteer work. Uh, I see all of those of you who <laughs> have put on ISSWs nodding your head. It's all volunteer work and it's a hell of a lot of work to do. And uh, at the steering committee meeting uh, in uh, Aspen, it was decided that, well, it went from here down south in the Rockies and it should go west. And uh, the committee decided to ask uh, uh, Larry Haywood to put it on. And, Walked up to Larry Haywood there in the bar at Aspen. Larry, we think that you would do a good job putting on one of these. And he said, yes. <laughs> and uh, so that's how the ISS has, ISSW has involved. Now it's gotten to be big business. Maybe Amory will talk about that. But uh, uh, speaking of the Jackson ISSW in 04, we had 650 paid folks, and our budget was a little under 250,000, and it went, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and big money, and uh, uh, fortunately, Hamry finally got the steering committee to figure out some way to have a reserve fund because you're putting on an ISSW. For instance, at Jackson, we were using the festival hall, which sits right on a fault line. Well, a festival hall is wood. The festival hall burns down, or we have the big earthquake. We're bringing in all this money. Uh, we have all these debts accruing. What's going to happen <laughs> if we can't hold the ISSW? So that's kind of the history of ISSW. So when you go to Breckenridge next fall, or fall after next, uh, do appreciate all the uh, uh, volunteer work that's gone into it. My next person that I'm going to talk about, I never had the opportunity to meet, a guy by the name of Charles Bradley. Ed, was he here still? Yeah, we crossed paths a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I admire Char uh, 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 Bradley for uh, what he he did. I'm going to show you his uh, gadget here to measure snow strength. Now, talking about snow strength, how many of you get in a pit wall with a bunch of students, for instance, and say, okay, this is how we measure snow strength, which is bonding, hardness, 
we first try to get our fist in. <laughs> if we can't get our fist in, then we go to this and then to this and so forth and so on. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you think that's kind of a Mickey Mouse way of measuring snow strength? <laughs> <laughs> I'm challenging all the smart guys sitting at this table here in the back room to see if we can come up with a better way that will fit in a little box, which we call our snow city kit, that we can take into the back country, stick into the pit wall, and come up with a better way of measuring snow strength. Uh, okay, the challenge is out there. <laughs> Send hoist, get working on it. <laughs> okay, so uh, Charles Bradley. So he came up with what is called the Bradley resistograph. So you push this down in the snow, and then you turn it 90 degrees, and then you get your reading coming up like this. And so what happens, you see this little pan here. As I pull down, it goes back and forth. That measures your snow hardness. And uh, then I will put this on and show you how this gadget works. So this goes on like this. You would have this already put together, of course, taking it out in the field. Now you need some pressure sensitive paper. But this isn't working too well right now. There's no paper in it and uh, it's pretty hard to get pressure sensitive paper now. But, uh, there's a fellow in Jackson by the name of Robbie Fuller who now is in possession of this and is gonna get it working again one day. This guy Robbie Fuller invented back in the 60s, the croquis, you know, the first eyeglass, uh, eyeglass retainer. He's a pretty clever fellow. So this clip goes onto the paper. And the weight of this clip will pull the paper through. This clips onto your boot. So you put this, <laughs> you put this down, <coughs> turn it, and then you get your reading as you pull this up. And you can pull it slowly or you can pull it fast. If you pull it fast, the paper comes out faster. So the reading of the Bradley resistor graph that turns out to be numerically the same numbers that you would get from the RAM penetrometer. So Bradley had an idea that never really caught on. Uh, these cost 500 bucks back in the 60s, or early 70s. But I admire him for what he did. His brother was at uh, uh, a winter park. Have any of you heard about the uh, Bradley Packer? Bachman. <laughs> <laughs> At Hamry. Well, I never saw one, but I talked to one of the patrollers, the Jackson, who came up from where far. You skied down pulling this thing, which was supposed to pack the snow and level off the moguls. And I guess if you crossed your tips and fell, I guess you'd get <laughs> <laughs> uh, your imagination is working. The third person I want to talk about was Bob Brown. Now correct me, Ed, Bob came from NASA? Um, actually, he was down in, uh, he worked on the Saturn V that went to the moon. <laughs> Not for, they used for orbiting. So he worked on Huntsville, Alabama before he came here. And he came to Bridger as a skier, thinking he was gonna come up with a model to, to model slab avalanche release or something like that. Well, he and Ted Lang both. Uh, Ted Lang came out of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. So they, they brought in two um, uh, 
rocket scientist to try to study snow and how to interject with the deadline. And Bob Brown, when he left, uh, retired a few years back, his comment was uh, he and Ted Lang got together and Ted said, let's get together and solve this little avalanche problem and get back to some real work. <laughs> but Bob retired and said, you know, it's way more complicated than rocket science. <laughs> Well, when I started putting on what I called a pro course, that would have been the uh, first one in January of, of 75. Incidentally, Liam came up and worked on some of those courses, too. Uh, I wanted somebody to be able to talk about the mechanical properties of snow who could, with authority, upon being asked a question, say, it depends. <laughs> and that was uh, Bill St. Lawrence, one of uh, Bob Brown's. Interject one more piece here. Um, Charles Bradley actually um, met Bill St. Lawrence and, and, and got him injected. But uh, Charles and um, John Montaigne were trying to uh, get more quantitative. And that's when they came over and talked to Bob Brown and Ted Lang. They weren't really involved in, in snow at that point. And then they brought him in and said, well, how do we do with this? And that's, so Charles Bradley had he brought Brown and Lang into it at that point. Okay. So he goes, he's sort of the root of it all, yeah. He and uh, John. Yeah. And uh, Montaigne and Bradley had the first snow science, <coughs> but snow science class in any uh, university in the U.S. All, uh, so, so the role of Bridger was uh, a significant in the early days. Uh, let me read you what uh, a guy by the name of Peter Lev told me about his early days here at the Bridger. Uh, Peter was a mountaineer, worked the first two years that Jackson Hole was opened, and came up here. So I sent him an email and asked him a couple questions about who was here then and so forth. Ono was a Bridger ski patrolman during part of my stay there. Not sure if Kanzler was on the patrol then. Kanzler eventually went to Big Sky and ended up snow safety director for a while at Jackson. I think he may, he may have been uh, weekend and in ski school at the university. We were climbing partners mostly. I don't believe Dwayne was patrol leader. Now Dwayne Bowles was a real good avalanche person. Wasn't he trained uh, in electronics? Well, yeah, I believe he was. He was uh, but the he, medicine he, guy, yeah. Yeah, but he was a good avalanche guy. He w worked at the university on an army snow research project as field manager. I was his assistant. We had snow study sites in the Bridgers, the Gallup, <coughs> and near Cook City in the Beartooths. This was 67, 68, and 69, if I recall correctly. Of course, I skied some with Anno and Kanzler, but it was Duane I attached myself to. Duane was uh, some connection to the Bridger Avalanche Control. He may have been in charge of it, uh, which was my special interest. In particular, he had the key to the rope toe going up to the ridge line. <laughs> control only toe. <laughs> and I went with him as often as possible on these control projects. Often it was an excuse to go over to the really great out-of-bounds train to the south. Can't remember the names of things anymore, but that would be Slushman's, which was a great place to take an avalanche school, but scary as hell when you get out there and you have an avalanche group of six or seven folks that just want to ski powder, you know. And <laughs> I was very impressed with Slushman's first time I skied it. There are a lot of little pockets out there. The whole thing can come out at once. Dwayne and I skied everything back then before any, uh, uh, anybody else ever thought about it. Also some good terrain to the north, including a big open field called the Apron, which, seemed to be do uh, which I seemed to remember doing at least once with Anno. Anno is now... He, went to Alta and became a, a snow safety and patrol director. Now he's general manager. We all talked about uh, Alta as the big time with thoughts of someday going there. 
As I indicated, Duane was a mentor to me. I went to Alta first, Duane arrived a few years later, but he was still a mentor as far as I was concerned. Of course, Binks, who hired both Duane and me, was the master of masters, in my opinion. In those days, Binks could hire whoever he wanted. All this was before the Forest Service bureaucrats took over. By then, Hano <laughs> was on patrol and soon to be in charge of snow safety. So that takes us to Alta. Uh, in 1946, uh, Alta, or the Forest Service, hired uh, uh, Mati Outwater. Mati came from World War II, was in the Battle of the Bulge, knew something about artillery. After the war, he spent some time traveling around uh, in uh, Europe, so he had an idea of, of what they had been doing for passive control. Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, Europeans uh, did not do much for active control until the last few years. Uh, his job was to make uh, Alta safe, or keep Alta safe for the skiers. And they built him a, a guard station, which had flush toilets, the only flush toilets in Alta. All the lodges had holding tanks. That, that was something else. It's something else when they pumped them. <laughs> in the middle of the winter, the uh, lodges smelled halfway between uh, sewage and and some kind of strong perfume after <laughs> those pumping operations. And uh, started studying snow. Came up with his study plot right outside in the bottom of the Flagstaff avalanche path, which eventually got wiped out. And like he says in his book, and then at that time we did a study of how far different objects got carried in the avalanche. Uh, in 1952, Ed La Chapelle came in, and as uh, Atwater says in his book, Avalanche Hunters, which if you can get a copy of, it's very interesting reading. And now the scientists come in, and so La Chapelle and uh, Atwater worked together uh, for several years. In 56, Atwater went to Squaw to uh, prepare Squaw Valley for the 1960 Winter Olympics. So from my perspective, what are two of the legacies that uh, Alta gave us? The first, in my opinion, was uh, uh, hand charging and artillery use of testing for stability. And uh, hand charging j just did not come as, yeah, we are in this and throw it out there. They first had to experiment with the old fashioned method of electrical detonation, which didn't work, you know, because they had to go out on the slope and it wasn't fast, it wasn't efficient. They had uh, unlimited uh, two and a half pound blocks of what was called tetratol, and I suspect it was about the same thing as uh, your hand charges are today. And uh, so eventually they would uh, arm those two and a half blocks with a safety fuse and pull away every nighter. And uh, then for long range control, uh, the Monte Atwater brought in the uh, National Guard from outside of Salt Lake. And they would bring the guns up, leave the guns there, and they'd come back and forth. One day, I can't remember if the highway was closed, but at any rate, Monty needed to fire, so he just hauled out the guns and fired, which of course raised all kinds of consternation in the district office down in Salt Lake. But as he says in his book, well, we set the standard, we shot the guns, and it worked. So after that, then the Forest Service allowed Forest Service personnel to shoot the guns. So that's our legacy in doing active control work. Now, of course, there's all other kinds of uh, gadgets and exploders and whatnot that work quite well, too. 
and in particular I want to talk about the beginnings of avalanche education. The Forest Service, beginning in the 40s with Atwater, started the Alta Avalanche School, and it was primarily for the Forest Service personnel in, uh, in the Rockies and the West Coast who had to deal with with avalanches or had avalanches on their district. And I came just this close to going in the early 60s from Jackson. The uh, yeah, number of folks from the Jackson district was three and that last uh, position was filled uh, just before the course. Had I been able to go to Alta, that boy, my learning curve would have gone up real quick. Uh, uh, a few years earlier than it did. But the thing about the Alta Avalanche course, the instructors were very experienced. The most experienced and tenured folks working with snow and avalanches up to that time. The national course morphed into what we now know as the National Avalanche School. And that was about 1970 when the Alta Avalanche Study Center was closed. And uh, the mandate of the forest, and the Forest Service still had money to spend. So the, the uh, next few sessions of the National Avalanche School were tuition free. And their mandate from the Forest Service was to get an avalanche school going. And uh, that was uh, uh, primarily La Chapelle and a guy by the name of Del Gallagher and uh, uh, Ron Perla. And, uh, uh, Perla went up to uh, Canada in 74, but he was still involved with the schools there in the early 70s. And they came up with the idea of, well, let's have a, a big school in the fall, in the classroom. We'll take 200 folks. And then we'll have those folks take a secondary, what's called phase two session in the wintertime. And uh, the level of instruction at the national school included the most experienced people in those days working with snow now uh, at, at that time. And even now, if you look at the website uh, for the National Avalanche School, Carl Berkland, uh, Dale Gallagher, um, you're on it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and in my uh, opinion, uh, the Alta School, which morphed into the National School, was a preeminent uh, avalanche school in the country just because of the tenure and experience of the instructors. So what I'm saying is that I, I think avalanche instructors should have a, a lot of experience working in the field. However, as the years went by and I worked on a lot of the field, uh, the uh, phase two <coughs> sessions in the field, finally it occurred to me that why can't the National School get it together to hold the school in the wintertime? Combine both the field session and the field sessions in the winter. I think it can be done. It would take some reorganization. Okay, so what was it like at Alta in 63-64? The winter of 63-64 at Jackson, what I later learned was a continental snowpack. We had early snow and it turned <clears throat> cold. Jackson is low elevation. This was a little snow cave ski area right outside of town. And uh, we had a good crop of depth whore. I hardly knew the word depth whore at that time. But you could dig down and you could be, bring up these big crystals that would shine and 
and the light that had not gone back and forth between kinetic and equilibrium looked like they were just going towards facets all the time, anywhere from four to six millimeters. We learned right away that once that forms, you don't ski pack it. So when you get off the lift, you go right down to the ground because you couldn't ski pack that stuff. And then the s snows came in. We had a big stormy period around Christmas time. I lost a ski in an avalanche. Ski schooler was completely buried with only a ski tip sticking up. And after I had gone down to Alta in March, the whole time paid ski patroller there at Snow King was killed in an avalanche just outside the ski area boundary, which uh, ran on depth work. So when I got down to Alta, they had the same snowpack. Depth hoar with a lot of snow on top of it. And right away, I attached myself to the snow rangers. That was my interest from then on. There were five of them in my memory, Liam. Now, Liam mentioned a guy by the name of Ray Lequist. Now, wasn't Ray in the summertime the uh, fire control officer? And in the wintertime, he was in charge of snow safety. He had two forest technicians working with him, as I recall. And Ed LaChapelle was in the upper guard station who would uh, participate on big control mornings. And what was the name of the guy who had, who, came from the east, he grew uh, 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 rhododendrons in the summer. Baldy, Warren Baldy. Baldy was his nickname. Yeah, yeah, Baldy was the fifth one. And so on a big control morning, they had five folks to control the highway and control the ski area. At that time, <laughs> ski patrolmen were not allowed to go out with them after nine o'clock. I could go out with them, which I did every morning that they went out, but I had to be back at the list at nine o'clock for no particular reason other than I had to be there at nine o'clock. If I wasn't there at nine o'clock, the patrol director would stand at the bottom of the lift with a shovel and I would shovel ramps for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so what did I learn from these guys? Well, they did a lot of ski checking. So I'd go out with them and they'd tell me, get back, get back, get back, watch me. So I was starting to pick up on slab boundaries. They wanted me back of the ground so I could do something if they got caught. I don't know what I would have done. No shovels, no probes, no beacons, nothing but hands to dig with. Um, they would shoot into drifts. And I wondered at the time about that because oftentimes the bullet would go in a drift and you might not see it go off. Well, did they have a, a dud or just what? And I don't know what the time fuse was on those shells. Sometimes you see a little puff of snow, uh, smoke and uh, snow come out. Of course, we know now that you may be more effective shooting in the shallow spots. Okay, uh, the Forest Service boys were serious about their job. Uh, Link was, was on the full time. Uh, the forest technicians would come up whenever they had to because they had to be there overnight. And they didn't particularly like to be there, but they did a good job. They were still serious about their job. And during the, the control morning, the Forest Service folks thought they owned, number one, the highway, and number two, the ski area. It was their terrain, and this caused a lot of, of conflict between ski area manager, because he wanted to, to make money get the ski area open. Couldn't do that unless the highway was open. 
couldn't do that unless the ski area was open. One morning we were cleaning the guns and the ski area manager was walking towards us and somebody said, here comes Mr. Grunt. And uh, a lot of tension there. I learned that once a decision was made, they didn't back off. That was the decision. They said, no, we can't open the highway today. We can open this part of the ski area. Well, that means that only the folks skiing that day are the folks in the lodge. So there was all the powder skiing that, that you would want in those days. And once a decision was made, yeah, yeah that's it. So these were to see, uh, served me well one day at Jackson, when Jackson opened the uh, full-time Forest Service snow ranger who was at Alta actually teaching uh, uh, the Forest Service Avalanche School with La Chapelle and Pearl at Alta. We had depth or we had a big st storm come in, and I didn't see any possible way that we could open the tram. We were skiing the tram from Tower 3, and that still gives you 3,000 vertical feet of avalanche paths to worry about. Main runs were coming out because the ski compaction in those days at Jackson was negligible even on most of the main runs. So I told tram control that they would not be open for the public that day, and right away, of course, I got a phone call from management, well, let's talk it over. Come on down and we'll talk about it. Well, there was nothing to talk about. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the advent of avalanche education in the mid-70s. Uh, who made a good avalanche instructor in the mid-70s? Well, there weren't many. There weren't many folks who I thought were qualified to take a group of folks out in the field and talk about snow and avalanches. My first courses were in Jackson and Silverton. In Silverton, I had a good cadre of folks, including Bachman, the Armstrongs. The San Juan project was just starting to wind down they were still hanging around. La Chapelle was there for a few years. And the fellow by the name of Art Mears kept coming around from time to time and walk in and visit with us during the th three or four years of this uh, San Juan Avalanche project. Now Art, at that time, had just completed a study of avalanche paths for the state of Colorado. He had a degree in geology. He had a degree in engineering. He was recently divorced. He had a house in Gunnison. He had a car. And most importantly, he was unemployed. <laughs> and uh, he was a great asset to me. And in future years, uh, Art liked to get around, and uh, you could entice him to work on an avalanche course in a location where he had never been. <laughs> a hell of a deal. Yeah. Get his room and board, get his transportation paid for, and make a little money on the side. There were only three women, if you can believe this, involved in snow and avalanches in the early to mid-70s and all through the 70s. One was Betsy Armstrong, who Don and I worked with in Silverton. One was uh, Sue Ferguson, who was a grad student of La Chapelle in the Northwest. One was named Pam Spears, and she got married. Her name went to Pam Spears Hayes, who was working for Marriott and Moore, in the early days of the Northwest Avalanche Forecast Center. So I would look for folks who had a good, strong background in mountaineering. And I think 
the reason they worked into becoming good uh, field instructors was that they had a basic understanding of the natural hazards, objective dangers of working in the mountains. In the summertime, it's rockfall, weather, hypothermia, lightning, and then I think that carried through into the winter with avalanches. And they would pick up on the behavior and the development of the snowpack real fast. The root runners, all you guys running roots, have a background, whether you know it or not, I think it's a sense that's built into us. When are the boundaries of the avalanche going to exceed what we expect them to exceed? Talk about this a little more. But their experience with avalanches there, are, there's nobody more experienced with watching avalanches go at your feet than folks running routes. And uh, you need to have, or you needed in those days to have a curiosity on how snow behaves, how it develops, how it slowly creeps down the mountain, how it builds up stored energy, et cetera, et cetera. And it helps if uh, you have worked in at least two different snow climates. Liam came from the Squaw. A guy by the name of Tom Kimbrough came from Alpine, ended up in the Wasatch. The story about Kimbrough, he uh, started working as a ski patroller in Alta, worked for the uh, Avalanche Center for a while, and uh, at that time, whenever I could get him to work on a Abbey course, he did. In one of the level two courses, I gave him a, a topic. It was uh, to compare avalanches and forecasting in the maritime climate as opposed to the, to the uh, intermountain climate. So he talked about three minutes on uh, what happens out there. Well, yeah, it snows. And then after three or four days, you know, we don't worry about that much avalanches. Here in the Wasatch, it can snow, and yeah, we worry about avalanches sometimes for a week or so after it snows. And then he'd go on to talk about what he thought the students should hear. So after that, his topic was Tom Kimbrough, topic to be announced. <laughs> But that all changed, that all changed real fast. And uh, there are well, well qualified, experienced avalanche folks out there who make just great avalanche instructors, including I'm sure many of you in this room. So I want to end up by, well first, you know, I've talked about Peter Lev. I want to show you another idea for enhancing your ability to forecast avalanches. And this is the avalimeter. When uh, Peter was at Alta, uh, he ended up uh, working for Banks as uh, one of the Forest Service snow rangers. When the Forest Service was still involved, Dave Hamry was uh, at Alta in the early days, and I don't know if this happened when you were at Alta or, or not, but it was a crystal clear night, full moon, just a beautiful night to go back country skiing. And uh, somebody knocked on Peter's door there at the war guard station and asked Peter if he wanted to, to uh, go a car and make a run with him in the moonlight. And Peter walked out, looked around, thought about it, and said, no, I, I don't think I'll go with you. About the middle of the night or late in the morning, early in the morning, another knock on the door. Uh, Peter, 
we got caught in an avalanche, but we're okay. <laughs> and uh, so Peter got to thinking about what was going on that particular night for that avalanche to run. Of course, this was a triggered avalanche. There was another Forest Service snow ranger that winter recruited from Fish and Game by the name of Jim Head. And uh, Jim Head got Peter thinking about the solar cycle, the effect of the moon and the sun during certain times of the day on the pull of the earth and therefore a potential mechanism of bringing a snow slope up to a point of instability. And so Peter got together with a friend of his after Peter did a lot of research. A few of you in the room here may have got a call. Send me the information on natural avalanches which have ran for no apparent reason and give me a time. And he came up with this gadget called the Avalimiter. So he and his friend actually sold these and then each year you would buy the up-to-date uh, calendar. The last year that they made the calendar, which means they probably weren't making any money on it, was uh, 1987. So uh, what is today? Today is <laughs> April Fool's Day. <laughs> so we go down to April. We go to April 1 of 87, and we have a circle and a red slash and a zero. So you very cleverly find the red slash on here. I have to turn this over to get the red slash. Okay, red slash and you light it up with a zero. Well, it's an O, I guess, it's an O. And then you look down at the longitude. I think we're right on the given longitude. Well, maybe we're a little to the right, so you would <laughs> give it a minus here, so you would go, go just a little bit, okay, wow. <laughs> look, look, it's all red. It's all red with some white in between. <laughs> so, so between, we start out at, at midnight. From midnight to five in the morning, you're in the red zone. From five until noon, you're in the white zone. That means the risk is, okay, white is low risk, blue is moderate, there's no blue here, so it's either high risk or low risk. <laughs> then at midnight, again, you pick up the high risk. So of course this caught on and so, said, wow, you know, I can take this with me and I make my run during the white zone, I'll be okay. <laughs> well, it didn't work out that quite that way. <laughs> <laughs> This is still referred to in the Wasatch, right, Lim? It was pretty popular for a while, ago. And the fact that we, we built the screw, still get the, uh, the title charts that are computed agonizingly difficult by somebody, and they're provided every year for us. And I think that uh, I would say that in some cases, it made as much sense as anything else did. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Six or eight years ago, the lift line there, the Gap 2 chair lift avalanche after it had been open all day. And you said all, all the avalanche, when you came down, you thought all the avalanche workers in, in Utah were looking for their avalimeter to see if they had <laughs> nothing else complaining. Yeah. Rod, I'll add, you'll be happy to know I actually have an iPhone app I might, on my phone now that. that calculates the influence of the solar lunar cycle based on where we are in the world. And it correlates 
really well with the sheets that we get from that unnamed source. <laughs> uh, and it, we, it's another thing, it's another thing to look at. As funny as it might sound, I have an iPhone app. Um, <laughs> it's also really good for hunting. <laughs> Correlates with animal activity. If you saw two years ago, um, uh, Doug had us talking about uh, some of our screw ups, and uh, after I talked about my particular screw up that day, which I think included everything that Ian McCannon talked about a few years ago on the personnel problem, the human factor. Um, I got to thinking about patrollers who died in the avalanche, which they provoked. And that year, uh, two patrollers had died in avalanches, which uh, that broke above them. The first was at uh, Snowmass. You probably remember this, Dale. Yeah, Roberto. Hmm? Roberto. Well, well yeah, yeah, Roberto. Uh, that was back when uh, when Al was still. Al, yeah. Yeah, yeah, snow safety director. Uh, I use that as an example. I use the uh, uh, Alpine. Uh, 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 Highlands Bowl as an example. But that year, this girl at Snowmass just skied out of the ski area boundary and she was just kind of looking around and triggered a small one above her, carried her over the cliff. The second one, uh, two years ago, was uh, at Alpine. An 18 year patroller at Alpine threw the bomb and the crown broke above her. Above him, so I began looking back at some of these avalanches that have occurred, where the ski area boundaries exceeded the expected boundaries. And uh, just a few years ago, that same thing happened at Jackson. It broke above the patroller who threw the bomb. And so my advice to all of us, all of you folks out there actively working, is, as uh, uh, root runners just never uh, or always anticipate ask yourself the question am I standing in the right place so I have one story to tell and then some of you may have some questions in uh, 1982 uh, Peter Lev and I held a seminar which we called Mountaineering Snow Natural Hazard Seminar. We had it in Jackson. For the mountaineering part of it, we brought in Chenard. And we had Steve Comito, the boot maker from, uh, from uh, Colorado. He came up and talked about the difference between leather boots and Gore-Tex boots and pointed out that uh, leather boots were just as waterproof as Gore-Tex boots. Peter Hackett talked about uh, high altitude issues, ataxia and all that stuff. And for snow, we had Perla and McClung. Now, this is a story that the Perla told at that seminar. They were both working out of Canmore, and uh, one day in the afternoon they were climbing up you know, one of those ridges outside of Canmore. Perla looked around and saw an avalanche had just run across the canyon. Asked McClung why that avalanche ran. Well, McClung is one of these guys that sometimes thinks before he speaks. And so there was a period of silence. And Perla was thinking, oh my God. God, you know, what did I get myself into? I'm going to get an answer about snow mechanics, which I cannot understand. And then McClung turned around to Perla and said, snow's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, you're welcome to come up and take a look at the alimeter. Figure out when you can ski this afternoon with the ball hazard. <laughs> and, uh, okay, any, any questions? Ron, I would just like to say that obviously, um, as one would expect, you certainly played down your importance and uh, what happened there in that significant change in outline education, but the way I look at it, it you really, you were the uh, moving force behind that. You got, uh, you got people out on the snow uh, teaching, not, not on the blackboard, but in the, in the snow pit, and uh, the opportunity to come work for you as a young outline guy was like the coolest thing in the world, and uh, plus you always had it at Jackson and was always snowing really great. I want to thank you for that. Um, yeah, but you, uh, for those of you who, you know, aren't aware, this is, this is the guy that changed it all. So, thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to say one other thing. Uh, Rod mentioned several C words, uh, continental and crust and things like that, but the whole word he mentioned once that he didn't emphasize that I'd like to is curiosity. And Rod and I spent a lot of time with the snow blowing down the backs of our necks looking at fracture line profiles. And I can attest to the fact that Rod is one of the most curiosity driven people I've ever seen. And it's that curiosity wondering what this thing is and what will, what it will do that drives his competence in educating other people to this mystery of avalanches. So my advice is to be a little bit like Rod and be very curious about this whole snowpack structure and the whole world of avalanches. One of the things I'd like to ask students, you know, there's two things that really make a field session in any course, whether it's what we now call level one or level two or level three, is first and foremost, if you can provoke an avalanche in the course. Uh, we, we use, well, coming from my background, I always carried explosives with me. <laughs> Until one day, uh, Forest Service said at uh, Jackson, said, Rod, you know, we would prefer that you don't do any more bombing in the backcountry. <laughs> but we could still go to ski areas, and, and Copper was a great spot. Uh, Dale and I worked on one course there out of Leadville. I don't know where we did the field work, but go to Copper, and this was before you guys opened up all those neat bowls like Spalding Bowl and Alpine Bowl and the Jocks Bowl or whatever. And uh, the Copper Patrol could usually go out and get what I again refer to as a delayed avalanche uh, by throwing a bomb on a little pocket here and there. And it would really make the course. The second thing is to be able to go up to the crown of an avalanche which had just run or had run in the past. And I, I would ask the students, why were the boundaries of the avalanche here? Why was the crown here? Why wasn't it up higher? How about the flanks? Why, were, why didn't the, uh, the crown line run along the, uh, the, the ridge farther? And uh, really, I think that's the essence of roof finding. Am I standing? too close to the flanks or too close to the crown, and the same thing works when you're running a route. If I throw a bomb here, am I standing in a safe spot? Yeah, we've all been fooled, and fortunately everybody in this room survived <laughs> their uh, underestimations of, of where we should be when the avalanche runs. Yeah, again, I say you, you guys from Big Sky Scott Savage, Savage gave his uh, slideshow at uh, at Telluride on controlling the 
south side of there, Long Peak. And you impress a lot of people. Uh, so Plus me at his mouth. I took my first avalanche course with Rod in, in 1984 at Red Mountain Pass with Peter Lev and, and uh, George. What was his name? Chris, uh, Chris. Chris George. So uh, thank you, Rod. I saw my little card. Kind of